Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, loved ones. It's good, good to be back with you after a number of weeks off. Um, tonight I have the great privilege of introducing to you uh, our guest preacher who will be bringing us uh, God's word tonight. His name is Steve Croker, and you'll see a picture of him and his wife Melissa and their four children there. Um, and they have come to us from Living Hope Church in Georgetown, Ontario, just outside of Brampton, Ontario. And uh, Steve currently serves at Living Hope as the lead pastor. And uh, Melissa, his wife, um, is privileged to be able to serve as the administrator for the Great Commission Collective here in Canada. And so we are so thankful for each of them and are blessed uh, to be able to strive side by side in gospel ministry with Living Hope and the other partner churches in the Great Commission Collective. And as I was thinking about and praying for the Croakers and thinking about uh, what the Lord has entrusted to them and our grateful hearts to them, uh, Steve and Melissa and family, uh, Philippians 1, 3, and f- 3 to 5 um, came to mind for you. Uh, It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I'm very thankful for you. You pour yourselves out for the greatest mission on earth. Amen? There's nothing greater. Nothing greater to give our lives to than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are modeling that. Always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. So thank you for all you do. And, And Croker Crew... In the, in the back row there, uh, it's not lost on me, uh, the sacrifices you watch your parents make, day in and day out. And so we're praying for you. We love you guys. And uh, we're so thankful to be able to minister alongside. And so let's be in prayer. Continued prayer for the Croker family, for protection over them. These are hard days. These are exciting days. But uh, there's a lot of opposition in these days. So pray for protection over them. Pray for refreshment for them this summer and an increasing fervency in the gospel. And for Living Hope Church, I pray for unity in the gospel and faith in the word of God and the Holy Spirit and increasing love for the Lord and a passion for his church. Amen. So let's put our hands together and give Pastor Steve a warm Hope Ottawa. Well, thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, so good to be with you guys. Uh, last time I was here it was New Year's Day. Things looked a little different in Ottawa. There's a lot more masks, a lot more snow, and so it's good to be together. It's always a privilege, though, to open God's Word together and to worship together, to pray together. And so I'm eager to do so. Uh, tonight, we are in Ephesians chapter 2. So grab a Bible, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at the whole chapter because it's amazing. And so it's just a feast tonight, uh, whether you're ready for it all. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 22. So turn there in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, the ushers are handing them out. Just stick up a hand. They would love to uh, loan you one. And if you don't own a Bible, they'd love to give it to you as a gift. So I think you'll find it really helpful to follow along. We're going to work our way through this amazing passage. And so I'd encourage you to grab a Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 22. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 22. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and let's, let's pour ourselves into God's Word. We know that it's got so much for us tonight. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who were once uh, were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. Awesome. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We pray as we open it tonight that your spirit would speak to us. Pray that you'd grant us faith, uh, conviction, clarity, understanding, that you would grant us new life. Pray that we would leave this place changed. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, do you remember back to March, March of 2020? In the early weeks of the pandemic, there was such a, sh uh, such a sense of, of a shared experience, right? We stayed away from each other, but we were all going through the same thing. We, we were all in this together. There was a kind of a spirit of camaraderie about the pandemic as it began. Nobody had faced anything like this, and we kind of bonded together while even keeping our distance. But then as we got into the second and third lockdowns, further restrictions, the mood really changed. We saw so much anger and division. And so now we find ourselves in a very different place, don't we? Where, where the world is more angry, more divided, more split. And the problems seem to be getting worse and not better. And even, even as the pandemic and restrictions sort of go away or move into a new phase, the, the anger, division, the, the, the pain is still there. And just finding new expressions. Well, so where, where do we look for answers and hope in this kind of world? Well, some are looking to politics, right? We need new political leaders. That's what's needed. You just got to change it up, and then things will be better. Others respond with anger and protest, and sometimes even violence. That sort of revolt is the answer. How's this going for us? Is this working? I want to suggest today that all these kinds of problems aren't the real problem, that they are symptoms of a deeper disease, just surface manifestations of a larger problem, that our solutions, therefore, are all misdirected. We're, we're all dealing with symptoms and not dealing with the disease. The, the real human problem is not the pandemic or the government or the crazy people on the internet, but the real problem is sin, human sin, that there's a brokenness, a brokenness in us, a disease of the heart that is at the root of so much of our struggle, pain, and division. 
And so then the real answer can't be found in politics or policies or education or protests or isolation. The real answer is found in grace. God's healing, God's saving, God's transforming grace through Jesus Christ. So tonight I want to tell you about a hope that is as certain as the rising of the sun, a love that is unstoppably strong and a forgiveness beyond your wildest imagination. And I want us to see the glory and the beauty of belonging, really, really belonging to a community, to a family that is shaped by the glories of this grace. And all this we find in the feast that is Ephesians chapter 2. Here's how it begins. Take a look with me at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul starts off this important chapter by looking at the human condition, our, our real situation. The gospel, if you, that word the gospel, the gospel simply means the good news, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us, what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. But before we can hear the good news of the gospel, we need to hear the bad news of our situation. Right? Just like before we can receive, before we're ready to receive the life-saving treatment or surgery, we need to come to grips with the unseen cancer that is quietly destroying us. Before we are ready to flee from our burning home, we need to awaken to the fire alarm and realize the danger that we're in. Nobody wants to give bad news, but sometimes it can save your life. They say that ignorance is bliss, but sometimes ignorance is destruction. So before we hear the good news of the gospel, we need to realize and admit the bad news of our situation. And this is what Paul does. And so it leads us to our first point, which is this, that you are more lost than you realize. You are more lost than you realize. He says that we are dead in sins, physically alive, but spiritually dead, a walking corpse. By nature, we are zombies, dead in sins. It's sort of a living death, walking around in your sins. And he says, we are born separated from God. Our default position towards God is not love and worship, but hostility towards him. That our, our every inclination as humans is selfishness, thinking only about ourselves, not the God we were designed to worship and to glorify. And so we are born spiritually dead, alienated from God, who is the giver of life. We walk, we work, we eat, we play, but in all this, we are numb to God lacking all spiritual life and vitality. And so we're born dead in our sins, following the course of the world, he says. We, we are shaped constantly by the foolish thinking of our culture, thinking and systems of the world that give us false gospels. They say things like this, you are what you do. You are what you, your accomplishments and your job, they define you. That's your identity. That's what matters. Do great things and you will be worthy. Fail and you will be discarded. You are what you do. Or you are how you look. The young, the beautiful, and the glamorous are exalted while the rest are discarded. Your worth is measured in your body and your sexuality and how you look. You are how you look. Or you are who you know. Your worth is measured by your fame and your influence. To be liked and admired is everything. To be alone and rejected is hell. You are who you know and who you are and who knows you, right? Or you are who you control. Your worth is measured by how powerful you are. How many people report to you? How many people do what you say? How many people follow you? Those uh, who are in charge, are admired, those at the bottom are discarded and overlooked as subhuman. This is the course of the world. This is the thinking of the world. These are the gospels, false gospels that are given to us from the world, defining us by what we do or how we look or who we know or who we control. And there's many other ways of thinking. And this thinking is the air that we breathe, the world that we live in. And he says, and so we're carrying out the desires of the body and mind, he says. And so our, our desires 
Our, our longings are twisted. They're broken. There's good longings in there, but so many of them are twisted into broken longings. We want things that we think will save us, but they can't. And so we pursue homes and vehicles and lovers and stuff, believing what the advertisers tell us. This will make you happy and whole. You will live a fully satisfying, flourishing human life if you own this vehicle, wear these clothes, marry this person, enjoy these things. We start to believe it. We follow the, the desires of our body and mind, and we believe these false gospels. We pursue these empty hopes, but they will always renege on their promises and leave us just as empty as before. They, the, the new technology breaks. The, the new things become old. The world tells us to follow our heart, but our heart so often leads us astray. This is our nature. This is our shared nature. This is the human condition. We all have this disease. It manifests itself in different ways in different people, but the poison is in all of us. I think we can all agree that the world is a broken place. There's this sense within everyone, believer, unbeliever, that this is not the way it's supposed to be, that it ought to be different. Um, we can just, we scan the news headlines, we look at events around the world, we, we, you know, we read or learn of violence and protests, a military coup, a abuse, a racism. And it's easy for us to blame it on those people out there. Like, can you believe that they're like that? Can you believe it, it's like, not, not my people, not me, but if we're actually being honest... The same problems live in my own heart. I'm also proud. I'm also arrogant. I'm, I'm also selfish and greedy. I also put myself first. Those problems out there also live in me as well. It, it's, a, it's a hypocrisy to think, look at those problems out there. Can you believe those people but not recognize I'm the problem? The problem's in me as well. Well, the Bible diagnoses our brokenness. We have a sin problem. We all recognize that something's wrong in the world. The Bible gives the diagnosis that, that we have a problem called sin. We've inherited a disease from our first parents called sin. It's poisoned our thinking. It's poisoned our feelings, our desires, and impulses. They cannot be trusted. It's led us to be selfish and proud, to glorify self instead of God. It leads us to disobey him, to follow twisted desires, leads into self-destruction. We're lost. We're broken. We're dead. See, if our problem was simply ignorance, it could be solved with education and information. Uh, we could distribute the right books, the right teachings, the right instructions, and education would solve the world's problems. If the problem was simply the society, that we could solve that with new, you know, elections and better policies and better laws, and we could sort out society if it was a societal structural problem. If the problem was economic, it could be saved with better practices, with more money, with investing in the right things that will grow the economy. You know, years ago, the great G.K. Chesterton was asked to submit an essay to the Times of London answering the question, what is wrong with the world today? People ask this question in every generation. So though it was many years ago, he was asked that same question. The Times was running a series in which they were having great thinkers of the day, authors, statesmen, political figures, answer that question. What's wrong with the world today? So Chesterton sent back a two-sentence essay answer. Dear sirs, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. You know, True Christian faith begins when I come to see that my problem is me, and the answer is God, not the other way around. So often we think, my problem is my situation, the situation that God has put me in. We blame God. We think the answer is found within us and that the problems are all around us. But Christian faith begins when we get things right. The problem is me. And the answer is God. And Chesterton understood that. That's the, that's the beginning place, the starting blocks of real Christianity. The problem is me, and the answer is God. 
So friends, we have to get this right, that you are more lost than you realize. The problem goes much, much deeper than you realize. Our problem is sin, and it's much worse than we, we think, and so we need a Savior. The problem isn't just ignorance. The problem isn't society. The problem isn't economic. The problem is sin, and so the need is a Savior. We need new life, and that's what Paul brings us to next, starting in verse 4. Take a look. Love how it starts. But God. It's been called the two greatest words in the English Bible. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What an incredible contrast. You were dead. You you were a follower of the whims and poison of the world. You were captive to broken desires. You were broken by nature. But God, that changes everything. God changes everything. God changes. When God steps in the scene, everything changes. Since 2013, self-help books have doubled their sales. There's more being published, more being sold than ever before. There's more growth in this category than any other category for book sales. We are hungry for change, and we are looking to change ourselves. We think that with a little advice, we can set ourselves free and make ourselves new. But we don't need advice. We need God. We need his intervening grace We need him to make us new. So many of us are working so hard to improve ourselves, to fix ourselves, to fix our marriages, to fix our relationship. We just leave God completely out of it. I got this. I got this. I got a book on this, so I'm good. I'm good, thanks. I got this on my own. We leave God out of it, and we insist on doing it ourselves like a three-year-old trying to tie their shoes when they can't. No, I got to do it myself, right? It's sad. It's pathetic. I'm going to do it myself, God. That's us, the whiny toddler, insisting we can do it ourselves. And we can't. See, there's two ways to live your life to tell your own story. As you think about your own story, your own narrative, the life, the biography that you're writing, there's two ways to tell your own story, with you as the hero or with God as the hero. In the first one, I You know, I faced this, and I faced that, and everything was stacked against me, and look at the odds I was facing, but I overcame. I persevered. I worked hard, and I made it happen. I did it. The blame goes everywhere else. The rescue comes from within, and the glory belongs to me. But in the second, I'm broken. I'm sinful. I went my own stubborn way. I made a mess of my life, but God, God showed mercy. God overwhelmed me with grace and kindness. God changed me, rescued me, transformed me, won victory for me through Jesus Christ. The difference between trouble and triumph is those two words, but God. The blame goes on me and my own sin. The rescue comes from God by his grace. The glory belongs to God alone. So we have to ask this question, who's the hero of your story? in the way you're living, in the way you're thinking, in the way you're telling your own story, who's the hero? Who's the rescuer? When you tell your story, when you think on your own personal history, does your story have a but God turning point in it? Or is it all about you and how you found the strength within to overcome everything that came against you? And you think you're rescued, but you're just living a lie. But God God acts, God intervenes. Because we're awesome? No, as the text says, because he is rich in mercy. He's got more mercy than he knows what to do with. He's got more mercy than you can count. He's rich in mercy. We were at the hotel we're staying at, and uh, we saw a limo drive by. You know, we're looking down. Oh, a limousine. I wonder what, 
You know, maybe who's famous? Some, some famous rich person, right? Some blowing their money on limos. And we were marveling, what well, I would like to be that rich, right? God's rich. God's rich in mercy. He's got tons of mercy. He's got more mercy than you can count. And why does God act and intervene? It says, Paul says, because of the great love with which he loved us. Great love. So the bad news is this. You are more lost than you realize. But the good news is this. You are more loved than you could imagine. Isn't that awesome? You are more loved than you could imagine. That's our second point. Let me ask you this. What do you think God's posture, his stance is towards you? Especially knowing how sinful, how broken, how lost you and I are. How do you think he feels about you? It's a real question. Think about that. How do you think God feels about you? Uh, angry, frustrated, distant, despondent, disappointed. These are the kinds of things I hear from people when I ask them this question. Here's the beautiful truth that I really need you to grab hold of tonight. He loves you. He loves you. Even on your worst day, not just he loves you when you nail everything, it just goes right, you have that perfect day. But even on your worst day, in your worst moment, in that embarrassing, everything is falling apart and I hope no one finds about, out about this moment, even then, even still, he loves you. The message of the Bible is not be a good person, keep all the rules, or else God will be mad at you. I know people who act like that's the message of the Bible. It's not. The message of the Bible is you're not a good person and you can't keep all the rules, but even still, God loves you more than you could imagine and sent Jesus to rescue you and to make you new. God's primary posture towards us is mercy and love. And in love, here's what he does. Look at verse five. He made us alive with Christ. The problem is we were dead in sin, spiritual death. And the answer, the answer is nothing less than resurrection. We are spiritually awakened by God's grace, united with Christ by faith and guaranteed a future physical resurrection. And so by faith, we are united with Christ. His death and resurrection becomes ours by faith. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, then his death on the cross is in our place. He dies our uh, our death. He dies for our sin. He pays our penalty. He takes our punishment. He pays our debt. And his resurrection guarantees our future resurrection. We experience new life with Christ and are spiritually raised. We are seated with him in victory. And so God sees us differently because of Jesus, no longer defined by our sin and our brokenness. Jesus has taken that from us, and instead we are seated in victory, welcome in God's presence, enjoying all the benefits that Jesus deserves. He treats us and sees us as he sees his own son, and he, he treats us as such. And this is all God's love and his mercy. It's not earned or deserved. It's received, what does the text say? As a gift. Look at verse 8. As a, it is the gift of God. And this isn't a one-time gift, but an eternal and ongoing grace. Look at verse 7. That in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Think about that. Heaven is an ongoing display and enjoyment of God's immeasurable kindness. It, it, it's not a kindness that runs out. It's not a one and done kindness. We don't tire of it. We don't grow, it doesn't grow stale. We don't get bored with it. We will continually and endlessly enjoy the rich grace and kindness of God displayed in a person like me being welcomed into a family like that. It's an ongoing kindness, an ongoing mercy and grace. If you are in Christ, you are a picture of grace today and will be forever. There isn't a point where it ceases to be grace as you walk in his presence. 
in eternity future. It will still be grace that keeps you there. It will still be grace that you marvel at in his presence. It is grace now. It is grace forever. See, heaven's not for good people that deserve it. Heaven is for broken and sinful people who have and continue to receive completely undeserved kindness and grace. And then look at verse 8 and 9. It's such a highlight. We see that it's all grace. It's a gift. A gift which we receive by faith. Through faith. So it's not something we earn or accomplish, but something we receive by faith. Why faith? Isn't faith something we do? You know, we believe really hard? No, no. Faith at its heart is not an accomplishment or a work. It's not something you do. It's not a deed. Faith at its heart and its root is trust. It is trust. It is resting in what you know to be true. So to be saved by works, works that we do, is to come to God with our hands full, showing him all the good stuff that we've done, making a case for why he should accept us and reward us. Look at all the things I've done, God. Look at, you know, this is all the accomplishment. I'm a good person, and here's the evidence. I'm bringing it to the trial to show. Exhibit A, exhibit B, right? We come with hands full, showing God all that we've done. But guess what? It's never enough. It's never even close. To be saved by faith is to come to God with empty hands, ready to receive We let go of our spiritual resume. We let go of our accomplishments and our track record. We come with empty hands, ready to receive, ready to cling to the cross and nothing else. Bringing nothing, claiming nothing, ready to receive grace. And in this, there's no room for boasting. If you really could be good enough and earn God's acceptance and reward, you could justifiably be proud and boastful, right? I mean, if you could do enough to earn God's favor, you, you should be proud. Look at me. I'm pretty special and amazing. I'm literally better than you, right? That, that's, what, that's, that's the results. That's where you end up. If, if I earned enough that God looked at me and went, yeah, you can come to heaven. You're good enough. I, I would have the attitude, rightfully so, that there's millions of people that I'm literally better than them. But that's not salvation at all. Salvation is by grace, received through faith. Since salvation is by grace, it always puts on display God and his immeasurable kindness. It glorifies God and not me. Look at God. Look at his mercy, his kindness. I was dead in my sins, and now I'm alive in Christ all by his grace, and so I praise him. It's about his glory and his name. The only thing I can boast in and be proud of is Look how glorious and beautiful Christ is that he's done this for me. Look at the glory of the gospel. Friends, you are more loved than you could imagine. It goes far deeper, far deeper than we real, often realize. Now, this is often where we end at verse 10. God's grace saves me personally, and it's amazing. But it's not where the Bible ends. Because not only does God's grace save me personally, but God's grace makes us a family. And that's where we get in verse 11. Like we want to split it there at the end of verse 10 because it's so glorious and so awesome. Paul runs straight into another point about what that does for us together. So let's jump into verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul starts again by showing what we were apart from Christ, especially referring now in categories of the Gentiles, the non-Jews. You were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Before Christ, Israel was God's covenant people. All the other nations were far off, not in relationship with him. You were strangers to the covenants and promise, he said. God's promises weren't for you. You didn't know them. You weren't in that, you didn't have those promises. And so you were without hope and without God in the world, he says. So we were far off, relationally distant, separated. But Christ brought near those who were far off. Not only does the death of Jesus cover our sin and judgment, he reconciles, he unites, he brings peace. You see all that language there. There used to be hostility Man, there's, there's so much hostility in the world, so much division in the world, right? Over, over elections and politics, over class and race, over education and beliefs, over you know, nations warring with nations, so much hostility, so much division, so much violence. But, but, you know, this isn't that unique, what we're living in, because in Paul's day, there was just as much, maybe more hostility and division. Same root problem. Same, same sin at work in the world. There was hostility between Jews and Greeks and Romans and barbarians. None of them got along. There were hostilities between men and women, treated very differently from each other. Between slaves and freedmen and nobles. So much hostility and division. You couldn't even, you know, you couldn't even change from those categories. You're just forever in those categories, locked in, in hostility with each other. But Christ comes along not to divide people further, to double down on these divisions, but to unite and reconcile. He makes peace and he kills off the hostility. How? Well, well, the gospel is the great equalizer. The gospel teaches us that we are all broken and sinful in equal need of a savior. No matter your politics, your race, your class, your wealth, your, your family of origin, no matter your job or situation, we all stand in need of a Savior. We, we all stand with empty hands in need of grace. There's equality at the foot of the cross. We are united in our need. We are united in our Savior. There's no strong and weak. There's not important people and unimportant people, powerful people and people to overlook at the foot of the cross. There's no us and them, rivals and enemies. We're united by grace. And then what the gospel does is the gospel teaches us to love our enemies. How can we stand against our enemies when God didn't stand against us when we were his enemies? His mercy and kindness toward us changes our hearts, changes the way we look at others. How can we treat others with hostility when God's never treated us with hostility? How can we who have received the immeasurable riches of his grace withhold that grace for others? So the gospel shapes the way we relate to people, the way we seek to love as we have been loved. So the cross of Christ heals, reconciles, and unites where there was two, there's now one. Where there was division, there's now unity. Where there was hostility, there's now peace. See, the gospel is not just for you as an individual, but the gospel is for us. The gospel is not just about you and your personal relationship with Jesus, you and your salvation. The gospel is about us belonging together in the family of God. So you are more lost than you realize. You are more loved than you could imagine. And you, thirdly, you belong in God's family. You belong in God's family. And so in a world of anger and division and hostility, the church is a place of reconciliation and welcome and forgiveness. It's true, some churches do have angry and divisive people. 
just as many hospitals are often filled with sick people, but that doesn't reflect poorly on the hospitals or the doctors. But those divisive, angry people either don't know or have forgotten the gospel of grace. They have forgotten the surprising grace of God that welcomes them into his family, and so they withhold welcome and grace, forgetting how God has treated them in Christ. It's not that Christianity causes their divisions, but those individuals are not Christian enough. The gospel hasn't shaped them enough to a place of peace instead of division. And so Paul then at the end of this chapter, uses three metaphors to help us understand our belonging together. He says, first, that you are not strangers and aliens. We, we could use words like you are not foreigners and immigrants, which is the idea here. You are not foreigners and immigrants, but fellow citizens, citizens not in Roman Empire, but citizens in God's kingdom. We truly belong, because of Christ, we truly belong in God's country, citizens of his kingdom. We're not out of place at his table. We're not foreigners and visitors. We truly belong in the land of grace where Jesus is king. The second metaphor is that you are not just citizens, you are family. Members of God's household, Paul says welcomed into his very home. Not just welcomed into God's country, but into his very home, into his family. In other places, the New Testament will state this in the language of adoption. We've gone from strangers and foreigners to God's own adopted sons and daughters, his family, his heirs. All that he has belongs to us. We are his family, welcomed into his very home and into his very heart. And so we are together family members of God's household. This is why the early Christian church started doing something that was not done before. They referred to each other as brothers and sisters because they really believed that the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ fundamentally changed how we relate to each other, even across language, class, race, etc. All the divisions of the Roman world, Jew, Gentile, men, women, slaves, masters, freedmen, Every stratum of society, they believe that the cross of Jesus Christ broke all hostility, and now we are brothers and sisters, family because of Jesus. Whatever Rome said about them, there was a more fundamental, deeper truth, a deeper reality that said we are family. And then the third image, the third metaphor building on that, you are bricks in a temple being built together into the dwelling place of God. So not only family, we are a temple. Together, being built up into a temple, we're all bricks in a building. An individual brick's not that impressive, but if you put them in the right order in the right place, you end up with a glorious and glamorous thing, right? Maybe many of you play with Legos, and so you know that each individual brick is not much to think of, but if you put them in the right order and in the right way, you can result in something pretty awesome. We are bricks being built together by God into the dwelling place of God. And this is why Christianity has no holy place. There's no holy land. There's no holy temple for God to dwell in. You know, if you asked an ancient Jew, where, where does God dwell? He might say that God's presence dwells in the holy place in the temple in Jerusalem. And so there are places, geographic, physical places, that are more holy than other places. There is a holy place in a holy temple, in a holy city, in a holy nation. And so you very much think of God's presence and God's dwelling in terms of land and and a physical element. But the New Testament teaches something totally different. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit among God's people, God does not dwell in a temple. But he dwells where? with his people, who are his temple, who are his temple. You are bricks in a building, not just any building, but a temple of God. He dwells among his people. So salvation is less about you and your personal little thing with Jesus, more about us together living in his grace. And so this is so true that we are something together that we can never be on our own. There is something that we must be together. On your own, you're a brick. Together, you're a temple. 
We are something together that we can never be on our own. We were made for a community, to be part of a family where grace is king. So what do you think of when you hear the word church? For some people, they think of an old and elegant building. I know there's many in this city built over 100 years ago, beautiful old buildings, right? Others might think of an event, right? Maybe robes and candles, songs and sermons, different styles, but some sort of program or event, something you would go to. But in the Bible, the church is a gathered people, a community, a family where the gospel is central, where Jesus is king. The Bible calls us to belong to a gospel community, a gathering of God's people united together by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And as the world is becoming more divided and more, more conflict, more anger, more hostility, the need for a community of grace is greater than ever before. I'm telling you, if we want to see this city and this country transformed, an election is not going to do it. But the transforming power of the gospel, healing and reconciling in the church, communities where grace is king and God's name is glorified. Now that can change the world. And indeed it is. See, for many of us, our understanding of the gospel is far too shallow. We might believe true things, but we don't believe them deep enough. We don't understand them deep enough. The gospel is good news that we believe, but then maybe we have nothing more to do with it. Yeah, I believe that, but it hasn't shaped us. But in the New Testament, the gospel is not just facts we believe, but is our identity. It's who I am. The death and resurrection of Jesus isn't something I affirm. It's who I am. It's changed me. It's changed all my relationships. It changed my posture. It changed how I think about myself. It changes how I think about other people. It changes how I think about the world. It's my identity. We are gospel people made new by the work of Christ in us. And this gospel calls us into a new community, a new family, a people who are broken and forgiven, a community that isn't marked by all the usual divisions and hostilities, but a community of reconciliation and forgiveness. A new humanity, united by Jesus, welcomed by God, growing together in him. Friends, your gospel may be too small, your view of it anyway. We need to see the depth of our sin, the seriousness of our situation, in order that we would begin to understand the depth and extent of God's mercy and grace in showing loving kindness to us in order that we, as we wonder at his grace, God receives the glory that he's due as our great hero, our great rescuer. Friends, if this this news is new to you, today is the day. Now is the time to receive it as truth, to entrust yourself fully to the grace of Jesus Christ, to come to him with empty hands, nothing to claim, nothing to offer, no arguments to be made, just simply to receive. If the news is old news to you, now is the time to be amazed again by its truth and to glorify the God who saves sinners like you and like me. So as the worship team can come forward as we submit ourselves to God in prayer to respond to what he has said to us in his word, let's pray together. God, We thank you for this truth that we read of in your word. God, I pray that you would protect us from just reading over words, familiar language, and to miss, just to have it fly over our heads. That you'd protect us from reading with our eyes while our hearts are far away. So God, I pray that we would truly know, believe, that our hearts would grab hold of these truths. We are lost. We are loved. We belong. God, I pray that you would show us right now in our hearts, this moment, where is it that we have failed to believe the truth of our identity in the gospel? 
and instead we have sought to define ourselves by what we do or who we know or how we look or how important we are, the job that we have, the money that we make, and we start to believe we're a pretty big deal because of these things that we're doing and these things we've got going on, and we look at our resume, we look at our credentials, and we're pretty impressed with ourselves. So God, I pray that we would, by your Spirit, have eyes to see the places where we are foolishly looking to other things to build an identity. We confess that. God, I pray that you would show us the places where we don't really believe in our hearts, that you love us the way your word says you love us. We think that you're a father like our fathers and they failed us a bunch. Or we think that you're really distant and despondent or that you... You don't really, you see our failures and you're on us. God, I pray that you would fill us with such a true, full, and deep sense of your love because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That we would know, not just in our heads and not just theologically, but we would feel deep in our hearts your love, welcome, affirmation. I pray that we would have a right understanding of the gospel that when you say we are loved, that we would believe that we are loved. When you say it's mercy and grace, that we would receive it with open hands. When you say welcome, we would know that you mean it. We are welcome. Help us to believe and help our belief to fundamentally shape how we, be- how we live, how we relate, how we talk, how we love, how we view and understand each other. May we be people of the gospel united together by the death and resurrection of Jesus living for your name. God, I pray that you would transform this country, this city through your people loving each other as you have loved us. Jesus, we love you. Empower us by your spirit to be faithful and to know, to know deep in our hearts that we are loved because of Jesus. We pray, amen.